because we have a great to see a very large crowd. Please, if you have any questions to ask our guest, please come and use the microphone along the side. We want everyone to be able to hear not only what you asked, but the answers so that everybody gets as much as they can out of the entire presentation. So please come up and use the microphone and don't be shy. And we would ask uh, no flash photography, please. However, uh, Mr. Beaton has said that he does not mind uh, videos being taken. He will reiterate, I believe he said it must be at least under a common license or something. My memory is not super good when I'm cold. No comments. Uh, we would also ask you no approaching the stage or anything, wanting to present gifts or whatever else. We're here for you know, the talk and Q&A, etc. So without further ado, to call this man multi-counted would be a bit of an understatement, as you can see from bio. Not content with just playing a bunch of amazing and endearing characters that we all know and love. He's now also an incredibly successful author. He's in gaming, etc. So without further ado, to sound amazing and entertain you, the fabulous Mr. Wilby. that make me a geek, and there's a lot of things that I am geeky for. 
before, but there is nothing in the world that brings me as much joy or is as fundamental to who I am as a, as a human being and as a geek as gaming. So I wanted to produce a show that would show by example why gaming is amazing, why gamers are great people, why gamers are not these antisocial weirdos who can't make eye contact with you when they talk to you, why we're not the caricature that we are often portrayed as uh, by mainstream media that can't be bothered to get past the stereotypes to see who we really are. The result of that is my show Tabletop, and I love it, and I'm really super proud of it, and I hope that you will uh, watch it. There are, I think, seven or eight episodes online now. There will be 20 by the time the, the year is over. One of the games we played was this game called Ticket to Ride. It's a really fun game where you're trying to connect trains across the continent of North America and complete routes uh, that other people can't complete uh, by collecting sets of cards. And uh, it's a really fun, really uh, uh, casual, entry-level game for, uh, for board gamers. So that's one of the reasons I chose it for the show. Um, my friend Shane Nickerson, who is one of the co-creators of uh, uh, Rob Beardick's Fantasy Factory and was one of the executive producers on Rob and Big, was supposed to come down and play on uh, tabletop. He couldn't play one day, so I called my wife in a panic for the set the night before and I said, can you come play Ticket to Ride tomorrow? Shane can't play. Knowing that she was going to say no, and she said, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and I was like, awesome. I called after she had her glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> So we, uh, so she came over and she played the, she played Ticket to Ride. It was me, my friend Colin Ferguson, who plays Sheriff Carter, and, uh, and, uh, and my friend Amy, who works at my comic book shop. And uh, at the show was over, when the game was over, we played the game for an hour and a half, and when we were done playing the game, we were counting up the trains to see what the score was. Uh, Anne was talking to Colin, and Anne and Colin and I are friends in real life, and I was talking to Colin, and uh, at the end of, of, of telling the story that she was telling, to punctuate the story, and hit the table, and bounced the table, and oh, 220 God. little plastic trains went everywhere. <laughs> and you can see it, it's on the internet, I mean, it's been shift. you can see it online, you can see us like this go... <laughs> and I just stand up and go, what did you do? That, anyway, it wasn't the end of the world, they put the trains back together, and it was actually really funny, we about it now. Um, <laughs> but you know what I really loved about it was that it sort of showed the world the relationship that I have with Anne. It showed the world why she is awesome. It showed the world why I love her as much as I do. And uh, she has fans. <laughs> <laughs> Which is super weird to both of us. <laughs> there, are, there are people who love her. She's really funny. She's on Twitter and she's super funny. And, and uh, uh, I, a lot of people, when, when they find out that I'm going to a con, they're like, that's great, is Anne coming? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> 32 fucking years of acting and you care about my wife is in one show? <laughs> like, I'm Metallica and she's Justin Bieber. Like, <laughs> I'm not Metallica because I don't believe in treating my customers like they're criminals. So I take that. I'm Rush. And she's another band that's not as good as Rush. I'm not pandering to Canada. I love Rush. Can I tell you how excited I was to fly into YYZ last night?
So these are two stories that I told at the Woodstock Founders Night in San Francisco. Um, and uh, they sort of tell you everything you need to know about us in uh, narrative style. Uh, the, first, uh, the first story is called The Excellence Incident. Also, I want, uh, before I get to this, um, I do my absolute best to keep this PG-13, but that's not the way that I write. So I apologize in advance to those of you who uh, are sensitive and offended by things. Um, uh, I would encourage you to take any complaints you have and direct them to the nearest brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> this is called The Excellence Incident. This was originally written close to a decade ago when I was still finding my personal narrative voice and enjoyed going out for the beefy goodness of a slaughtered bovine creature to be eaten with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> uh, I cleaned it up a little bit since I first wrote it because I saw things and I was like, I'm going to be my own editor. Uh, so this is called The Excellence Incident. Many moons ago, my wife and I found ourselves at a Black Angus restaurant. Do you have those in Canada? Yeah. Yes, okay. Because I didn't know if I was gonna have to go. It's like if you talk about Tim Hortons in America, people look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's because we don't have to. Um, so we went to a Black Angus restaurant. I don't know what we were thinking. Of. The waitress comes over to our table after our food had been delivered and she says, is everything excellent? <laughs> now listen, I know that this girl was just doing her job. Just as she had been when she tried to upsell us on a half craft of Fesser Merlot. By the way, the wine comes out of a tap at Black Angus. Is that weird? Am I the only one who thinks that's weird? Like, there's two taps, and one says white, and one says red. And, and things that are nominally that style come out of those taps. But I, I'm not comfortable with wine coming out of a tap. Look, if you want to pull it out of a cask, fine. I'm just, it's fine. Don't try to give it to Khaleesi, but that's fine. No problem with that. But why? I just don't think it should come out of a tap. And also, I went to a pub the other uh, last night that's nearby, a uh, pub, and there's like 40 taps, but it's all the same shitty, watery lager beer. What the hell, Canada? <laughs> like, why do you have, why do you have, like, why do you have 11 taps in this place when it should just be a guy peeing into a bucket? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> Sorry. I get sidetracked. <laughs> so I know that this girl is just doing her job. And I, uh, I go out of my way to be really kind and patient and, and, uh, and, and just like not a dick with, with people who work in the service industry because I know that probably uh, uh, eight in ten people they encounter are the opposite of that. But something in my head snapped. Before I could stop myself, I heard the following come out of my mouth. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent? No. Look, it's fine. In fact, I'll even tell you that it's nice. But excellent? If I said yes, I would really be devaluing the entire word and concept of excellent. <laughs> My wife Anne gasped. A bus boy a few tables over dropped a stack of plates. <laughs> the music playing in the restaurant was interrupted by the scratching of a needle across the <laughs> Remember, yeah, remember in Cable Guy when they're at medieval times and Janine Garofalo looks at Matthew Broderick and goes, Dude, I've got a lot of tables. And we all know, oh, there's the asshole. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> We all looked at each other, shocked, wondering what was going to happen next. He's not usually like this. And said, don't apologize for me. <laughs> I'm not usually like this. Uh -huh. The waitress disappeared into the kitchen. We're not getting any dessert, and said. In fact, we're not getting any more food that anyone in this restaurant other than us has an opportunity to touch. <laughs> Probably a good idea. We finished our meal, and I apologized again for what what for what would become known as the excellence incident. We finished our meal. I apologized again. We paid our bill. 
I overtipped the girl as penance for my transgression, which I decided was intended as a light-hearted little joke that somehow went off the rails between my brain and my vocal cords. <laughs> but I did not. And I will not. Wait. On the question and concept of excellence. A man must stand for certain things, and I have chosen this. The line on excellence will be drawn here. Here and no further. <laughs> on the way home, a quieter drive. <laughs> Anne turned to me and said, Excellent. <laughs> We're black and Angus. Let's try for adequate. <laughs> from there. Well, thanks so much for speaking up. We were in the restaurant. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> in which highlights for children is discussed at great length. <laughs> Last night on the way home from dinner, I asked my wife, do you remember the magazine Highlights for Children? Of course I do, she said. I remember how I hated going to the doctor when I was a kid until I started reading Highlights in the waiting room. Turn right at this intersection, I said, and Trader Joe's will be on the left in a block. Do you have Trader Joe's in Canada? No. no. Okay, so Trader Joe's is a restaurant, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a small specialty market that we have uh, in a few cities in America. It started in Southern California, so it's one of those things that I just took for granted, but it's a really big deal everywhere else. But they finally opened one in New York. The line to get into Trader Joe's was like two hours and stretched around a couple of blocks. It was a line to get into a grocery store. Um, but it's a wonderful restaurant. They've got all kinds of really great, sorry, I keep saying restaurant and I mean uh, uh, market. It's a wonderful market. They have all kinds of uh, uh, like really carefully sourced food. They've got a really great wine selection. They have a lot of really great prepared foods. There's a great cookbook called Cooking with All Things Trader Joe's where you treat Trader Joe's like it's your prep kitchen. I love it. Here's the thing about Trader Joe's. The person who decides where Trader Joe's is going to go goes around to all sorts of places. He finds real estate in great locations with great, usually historic buildings. But then if the parking lot is bigger than three cars, says, no, we're not going to drink. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what Trader Joe's is. This is where we were going on our way home after dinner. Uh, I said, turn right at this intersection, and Trader Joe's will be on the left in a block. She turned right, and I realized that Trader Joe's was actually to the left. Oh, my bad. It's actually back to the left. As we drove under the freeway to a place where we could make a U-turn, I said, did anyone ever read highlights in some place that wasn't a doctor's or dentist's office? The library at my school had a subscription, Anne said, so we read it there. We got to the next intersection, which featured a nice big no U turn sign. <laughs> well, this quick stop at Trader Joe's is turning into quite an adventure, I said, as we waited for the red light. We were quiet for a second, then I said, You haven't seen highlights in someone's house. It would have been like seeing your teacher in the grocery store, you know, like it's familiar but out of context and makes you uncomfortable so you make eye contact with your shoes the entire time and hope to just get out of there because somehow you're going to end up with homework because you ran into your teacher in real life. <laughs> the light turned green and we made a left into a dark industrial street. You know what I always hated about highlights, Anne said. Some idiot kid had always circled the hidden pictures. Oh, seriously, I said. Fuck that kid, man. That kid's a dick. And what kind of parent gives their kid a pen to draw over a magazine that's obviously intended for more than one kid to read? Asshole parents, I said. It's called Highlights for Children, shirk. Not Highlights for Your Children. Because doctor's offices don't exactly have pens lying around everywhere. She said, there's one, and it's attached by a string to a clipboard. <laughs> I lost my place. <laughs> it's all about timing. <laughs> there it is. Yes, 
that's a moment to go into her purse, dig around that used Kleenex and that giant weird kind of checkbook wallet thing that moms carry, and find the pen. We turned back toward her at Trader Joe's, and I raised my hands over my head as we went through the freeway underpass. Wee! Put <laughs> my hands back in my lap. I mean, that's a lot of time for her to think, hey, maybe I shouldn't be giving little Johnny Snotface this pen to ruin the magazine for all the other children. We turned into the tiny Trader Joe's parking lot and parked the car. So we got out and walked in, I said. You know, Highlight should have done a goofus and gallop about that. <laughs> You've spent a lot of time thinking about this. <laughs> What I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I wrote a book, and it is called Memories of the Future Volume One. Is anyone in this room familiar with this book? Oh, good. So a lot of you are hearing this for the first time. That's exciting for me. <laughs> the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation is not very good. There I said it. <laughs> it's okay. Because Star Trek The Next Generation eventually becomes, in my opinion, the best of all the Star Treks ever. <laughs> um, but uh, it took us a little while to find ourselves, to find our voice, to figure out what the show is about. And um, I wrote these like episode recaps of the first half of the first season uh, that are sort of like looking back at Star Trek The Next Generation the way that you would look through a high school yearbook. Um, uh, like if you're looking through the yearbook, you'd like, you would say things like this. Oh, I remember him, I love that guy. What was her name? <gasps> remember when we went to this place and that thing happened there? Oh my God, I can't believe I thought that was cool. I'm such a nerd. <laughs> like, like those, those things, you know, like, boy, am I glad those pants never came back. Like those are like, those are things you'd say when you're looking through uh, the yearbook, right? Well, for me, um, Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation was my high school. I started when I was 14, I finished when I was 19. And uh, it, looking at it, looking back at it again, is very much like uh, looking back through this yearbook. So I wrote this book, and it's uh, uh, sort of uh, humorous uh, recaps of the episodes, followed with uh, a little bit of uh, like insights about uh, uh, like what I remember from production, some behind-the-scenes memories, some quotable dialogue. For example, nice planet. And uh, uh, the uh, the sort of the bottom line is sort of take the long view and sort of analyze Star Trek uh, in the context of the larger arc of the first season. Uh, and then I give each episode a letter of grade, and even grading on a curve. Um, it uh, it wasn't always easy. So um, I uh, I want to read you a little bit from uh, Justice. Um, Justice is one of my favorite bad episodes from the first season, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm just going to uh, read you a little bit of the synopsis. I'm going to put my clock out here so that I don't. I don't want to take up. I, I don't want to sit here and just talk about the things I'm interested in. I also want to take your questions. So this is called Justice. Um, uh, oh, extraordinarily important bit of context that I always seem to forget to, to leave out here. Um, I love Star Trek. I'm super proud of Star Trek. I was a huge Star Trek fan before I started working on Star Trek. I was a fan the entire time I worked on it. Um, I was not a fan for a while, which is just a consequence of being a late teenager and trying to figure out who I was. And then around my mid-twenties, um, I sort of had this experience at the appropriately named Star Trek The Experience in Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, that kind of like, that kind of like re reminded me everything I loved about Star Trek. And it helped me kind of get past the stuff that I didn't like about Star Trek. All of this is, is uh, uh, told in the story, the uh, saga of SpongeBob Vegas Pants. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, kids, is a good reason that you should uh, put some thought into the titles of your stories. Because you might be calling something the saga of SpongeBob Vegas Pants ten years later. Uh, and it's in my book, uh, Dancing Barefoot, and then it's also excerpted in Just a Geek. Uh, so that's very important context. I am not here to just sort of like whiz all over Star Trek, because I genuinely love it. Um, but, like, sometimes you have to look back on things and, and laugh, and that's what I'm doing with this 
Justice, originally aired November 9th, 1987. Ah, my precise! <laughs> uh, directed by James Conway, starting 41255.6. Synopsis. After dropping off some human colonists in the Sternod solar system, the Enterprise notices a rather nice Class M planet in the nearby Rubicon system. It's called Rubicon 3. Card sends an away team down to the surface to find out if it's a good place for some shore leave. And they return with some very good news. It's clean, it's beautiful, it's populated by friendly humanoids, and they really like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> At the drop of a hat, according to Jordan. Any hat. Caution hat, knowingly. Picard sends a second large away, larger away team down to the planet to see exactly how many hats they're going to need. <laughs> because every responsible Starfleet parent would want to send their children down to the galaxy's longest running planetary orgy, he orders Wesley Crusher to go down to see if the planet is a good place for kids to hang out. Thanks! <laughs> After beating down to the planet, the away team quickly learns three important facts. Fact number one, the planet's inhabitants are called the Eo. They like to jog everywhere. <laughs> Fact number two, they are all beautiful blonde models, possibly descended from some sort of Maxim FHM breeding program. <laughs> Fact number three, the entire planet is clothed in six yards of fabric. <laughs> The Edo's leaders jog up to meet the away team, greeting them in the traditional Edo manner. Lingering glances and inappropriately long hugs. <laughs> Troy says, I'm sensing a lot of boners. <laughs> Before the Edo leaders will tell Riker how many people they can bring down from the Enterprise, they suggest they play at love. Rivon, the female leader, suggests that Worf play with her, while Leator, the male leader, looks at Riker, jams his true desires deep into the closet and asks Troy if she'll play with him. <laughs> Just before sexual harassment Panda shows up, what's the pressure goes, dudes, this is bullshit. Either hook me up with some fine Edo ass or get me away from you creepy middle-aged swingers so I can find it on my own. <laughs> Actually, what was the question play? <laughs> but I ran into the actor who played him at a convention. And that's what he was thinking. At this time. <laughs> what was the actually says is, um, <laughs> um. <laughs> Sensor malfunction, but it turns out to actually be like 
like the giant screaming death monster just outside? Who, you, the captain would be fired. <laughs> the, the ship would never be, at, would be in the shop all the time. Be like, would you fix the fucking sensors, please? <laughs> Are you sure? I don't know, it's just what the sensors say. What do the sensors really do, anyway? Well, they sort of sense things that are outside the ship. Oh, really? I'm the captain, I think I know what the sensors do. Carry on. Go to warp speed and separate the saucer section. That seems to fix things. After Data addresses this mysterious object that's sitting out there, it reveals that it's actually just a harmless corrector set. <laughs> the car orders Jordy to stick his head out the window and tell him what his visor picks up. Because <laughs> the ship's sensors don't work, but Jordy's visor is totally going to find out what that thing is. Are you sure we should just use the sensors on the ship? No, I don't trust those sensors at all. Alright. My advisor my says that I need to construct more pylons. Data <laughs> also doesn't know what it is, but Jordan reports after complete spectral analysis as if it's, that it's, it's a thing, but it's not really there, like the script to the last outpost. <laughs> because it sends out the universal symbol of I'm serious about messing with you, a ball of white light, which penetrates the Enterprise, cuts off all contact with the away team, and demands that Picard explain why the Enterprise is orbiting Rubicon 3. Of course, Picard then spends 10 fucking pages explaining why humans are trying to colonize the galaxy, why it's important, and how easy it is to take up some time in the script by talking in a big old circle about nothing. Here's what Picard should have said. We are going down to the planet of Humpy Orchita. Do <laughs> you have anything to add? No, oh, that's it. <laughs> All right. We're <Recon. laughs> This irritates the ball of light as much as it irritates the audience, and it shows its displeasure by whacking Data in the head and pinning him unconscious to the ground. This is a theme in a lot of the early TNG episodes. Picard's speeches get someone else tossed around. <laughs> And I don't know, like, if I were a pissed off alien trying to get the bald guy to shut up, I just might throw him to the ground instead of the <laughs> Down on the planet, Wesley's jogging around with his new friends. Unlike the adults who are busy getting their freak on in Plato's retreat, these kids are busy showing off their gymnastics skill. Because that's a thing you do on the <laughs> I'm going to go out for a jog with him. Oh, are you going to show him a back handspring? I'm not that kind of girl. <laughs> One of the Edo boys walks on his hands. Ooh, Wesley, you got served! Wesley serves back with some cartwheels and a round off. It's on! <laughs> it's so on that the girl get it's so on that the girl gets so hot for Wesley that she asks him if he'll teach her how to play ball. Oh, you bet, baby. Uncle Wesley will teach you how to play ball. <laughs> she just slip into this latex bodysuit and put on a black wig. We'll play all sorts of ball, you dirty bitch. <laughs> That's weird, I don't remember writing that. That's not an uncorrected proof or something. Wesley tells them to get a bat. When they don't know what a bat is, he describes Warp's penis. Well, the kids run off to play ball, Riker wanders around the kids chambers, past a lot of Edo who are dropping a lot of hats. And seriously, Edo, if I could just talk to you for a minute, we can smell the astroglide all the way from Earth, guys. <laughs> if you keep this up, we're relocating you to a planet in the Cinemax Nebula. <laughs> After a conversation with Worf about Klingon sex that unfortunately forced a lot of fan fiction to be taken out of canon, <laughs> he in the Enterprise and he finds out that his communicator isn't working. He gets the away team all together in one place just in case something weird is going on. When Worf goes to get 
Tasha, he learns that the Eos spend all their time running around and fucking because they have some rather interesting laws on the planet. Break some arbitrary rule in an arbitrary place and you die. <laughs> Kinda sucks. <laughs> but planet full of free sex! <laughs> Meanwhile, in the development, nobody saw coming, Wesley breaks the law. <laughs> One of the cops asks Wesley if he freely admits to the heinous crime of falling on new plans. Wesley stands up straight and declares, I'm with Starfleet, we don't lie. <laughs> oh, Wesley. You may be able to save the ship, but you cannot save this bad dialogue. <laughs> Riker apologizes for the mess. Wesley apologizes for playing ball. None of the writers apologize for the dialogue. <laughs> Tasha shows up just a little too late to warn you about the laws. After a quick kangaroo court, the mediators get ready to deliver some justice, Edo style. Celebratory riots break out all across America while people get ready to set cars on fire in celebration of Wesley Crusher being executed. <laughs> The cock blocks them and saves Wesley from certain death. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, because uh, I'm running out of time. Um, so, uh, up on the bridge, the glowing ball of light hops off data, and communication with the A team is restored. The A team? <laughs> Just put BA and face on the camera. <laughs> there was plenty of BA and face on the meets the away team, finds out that Wesley's been left in the Edo's custody, and has a long talk with the Edo about law, justice, and the death penalty, and other hot-button topics that would probably be very inspiring and thought-provoking if they weren't delivered to a group of half-naked sex fiends who get really petulant when they don't get their way. Apparently having to talk about tough issues instead of banging the person closest to them really grinds their gears. <laughs> so, then they, get, then they start talking about God. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm just going to skip that part because it's really ridiculous. Except for the part where Picard takes Rebond, the female leader, up to his uh, quarters um, so that she can look out the window and see God. This is an awesome homage to the original series because every time Captain Kirk brought a girl back to his quarters, he showed her God. <laughs> to me. Volume 2 is in the works. It should be out hopefully by the end of the year. Um, so it looks like I have about 20 minutes to take questions from you, the assembled audience. Uh, my understanding is that there's a microphone here. I've found in the past that the way this works best is if you line up roughly four at a time. Otherwise, it just blocks the view of the audience, which is a bummer. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, you, sir, there, closest to the mic. Go first. Will Wheaton, you are... I love your work on Big Bang Theory. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Like, you know, I wasn't like a fully formed human being. I mean, I was only, I was only 14. 
So I was still a very low level uh, character at that point. So I, um, I just did my best to wonder if you're paying attention to the answer that I'm giving you. <laughs> oh, and I didn't think you were. <laughs> Each 
character is a person we knew, or, or in some cases were. And one of the reasons I think all of us are very good in that movie, because we're very young and we're not really old enough to really know what we're doing, is that Rob hired actors who were very much like the characters we played. So I was shy and awkward and weird and nerdy and a little bit of a writer. And um, uh, I mean, I had a better relationship with my family than Gordy did. Um, uh, and River was really cool and everybody really wanted to be like him and he was kind of the de facto leader of the four of us. Corey was just, was, in, uh, was angry and full of pain and rage, being directly because of his parents. And, uh, and, and Jerry was, was just a really funny, sweet kid just trying to get along with people. And, uh, and it was, you know, it's weird. It's, it's, it's like 20 years, no, sorry, not more than that. Um, 30 years. Um, <laughs> look, it's a lot of years, shut up. <laughs> it's a lot of years since now, I mean, you know. And this is the first year that a lot of us have gotten together. Um, and we got together at, uh, at a theater to, to do a, an interview for one of the morning shows in America. And it was Rob, Richard Dreyfus, me, Corey, Jerry. We got there. And the producers, uh, you know, we all walked in and we walked up onto the stage and Rob said, I feel like there should be an empty chair here for River. Yeah. And it was the first time since River died in 93, I think, that I cried for him. It was the first time his loss was very real to me. Um, it's sort of like if you left, you know, if you left home, one of your pets died or something like that. You come back and it's not there anymore. It's just like it was there and then it wasn't there. And that kind of, I mean, that really minimizes the person's influence in your life. But I mean, it's that sort of like, River was there and then he wasn't there. And we weren't close when River was a massive addict. We just, it's, there are people who can really be close and help addicts through things that I'm not one of them. It's one of my failings. And, uh, and, and I, I missed him for the first time and felt his absence for the first time. And the next time, then after seeing Stand By Me, when he fades away in the movie, I just sat there and sobbed because it was like, it was a very real, a very real loss. And it was weird to me to be affected by Stand By Me the way people who weren't part of the movie told me they were affected by it. Um, and Toy Soldiers was just a freaking good time. <laughs> I mean, we're, we, were, we were all 18, so we were sort of like old enough to know better, young enough not to care, on location, um, uh, goofing off nonstop that entire film. Uh, one of the things about Toy Soldiers is that I said to Dan Petrie said, would you do it with like a, like a New York accent? And I was like, well, what kind? There's a lot of different ones. And he goes, just, you know, like a generic, you know, like New York accent, because you're supposed to be from New York. And I said, well, I mean, I guess, but you've got to make sure that I do not sound like Corey Feldman in Lost Boys. <laughs> he's like, all right, I will not let you sound like Corey Feldman in Lost Boys. I go to the screen and I was like, I sound like Corey Feldman in Lost Boys. <laughs> But that's a great movie, and you know, when it was done, Sean Aston and I were like, oh, we made an action movie, we thought it was more than that. Um, but people love it so much um, that I, I feel really good about it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep my answer short. Hey, well, uh, after you're joining us, bigger. Why are you being moved? There's not five minutes. There's nine minutes, according to my clock. <laughs> You gotta tell me, as a fellow gamer, yeah. what do you prefer? 3.0 uh, Dungeons & Dragons or the 4th edition? You mentioned about... Uh, okay, so 4th edition is a great game, but it's not a role-playing game. It's a tabletop miniatures war game. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, I, but I, think, I think it has more in common with uh, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay than it really has with Legacy D&D. Um, I enjoyed uh, a lot of 3.0. Um, I don't like the 75 pages of grappling rules. Um, or as I call it, Pathfinder. Um, I, uh, I, I really, really, really love the D&D basic rule set from 1981. That's where I started. Uh, What's your favorite of the my favorite RPG is Fiasco by Jason Morgan. It's a story about an RPG. Next question, please. I'm fast. I've been sent to say hi and ask. Hi. Lately, your your characters have been rivy. Are you channeling your inner JB? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. I would answer the question in Roth 13, but I don't have the uh, macro in front of me. 
Next, Next question, question, please. Worst TNG episode you ever had to work on? Um, was I in the battle? The battle's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, no, you know what, actually, I think Naked Now is pretty horrible. I mean, I think it's really terrible. Um, and it was a bad idea. Like, after the pilot, the way we're going to introduce these characters to the audience is by getting them all drunk. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Thank you. You're welcome. Next question. Uh, first, I'd quickly like to say, uh, on behalf of the great uh, Klingon scientist Sheldon Cooper, we just Game over, Moon Pie. <laughs> a lot of those lines, um, two, of your, two of my favorite characters of yours are your character in the Guild, and of course, your character in uh, Big Bang Theory, nominally yourself. I'm wondering how you feel about playing villains, or at least jerks. Playing villains is great. It's because the reason that you become an actor is so that you can be. Uh, some, someone or something you're not. Like, you just get to pretend. You get to create a character and then be that character for a little bit of time and then go back to your real life. A lot of people are surprised to find out that actors, when they're not on stage, are, are quite introverted and shy and, and, and weird um, because we do all of that. Like, we don't want attention when we're not performing. And being, uh, being Evil Will Wheaton is incredibly fun. And, uh, and being Fox is, is incredibly fun. And being Dr. Parrish and Eureka is incredibly fun. Because these guys that are all, you know, they're, they're jerks, but they're, from their point of view, they're justified. Uh, Bill Brady said that the villain is the hero of his own story. And, uh, and when I kind of internalized that and, and realized that Evil Will Wheaton just is, Evil Will Wheaton is to Sheldon as a cat is to a crippled bird. <laughs> you know, like, It's just, uh, it's, or, or, or he's, he's just like, he's such a great troll, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I will tell you a very quick, very fun story about Big Bang Theory. I was in San Francisco uh, waiting, for, uh, waiting for a taxi, and a guy comes up and he goes, I don't want to bother you, but you're on the Big Bang Theory. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I love that show. And I said, thanks, I love it too. I'm really, I have a great time when I work on it. And I was a fan before. And, and he said, and you're so funny on it. I said, thank you very much. And, and he said, I, I'm so embarrassed, but I know you play Will Wheaton, but I don't know what your name is. <laughs> and so, I guys won a contest. <laughs> In your introduction, you talked about why you started doing tabletop. How did it come about? Is it just born from the success of the guild? Felicia was going to put a channel on YouTube and, and was going to pitch a channel to Google. And uh, in the act of pitching it, she had to put together a slate of shows. And she called me and she said, do you want to do a show together? And Felicia is one of my best friends in the world. And we work really well together. We're terrific creative partners. And uh, I just know that when she has an idea, it's going to be great. And I said, yeah, what do you want to do? And she said, I'm just thinking like maybe a thing where you review games. And I went, eh. I don't know, I don't want to do a thing where I'm just standing around talking, and what if we played games and, oh my god, we played, and then the whole thing just came together <laughs> like that. And then we have a terrific producer, Sherry Bryant, and Adam Lawson, and Boyan Rodakovich, and Kim Evey, are just amazing people who work really hard to, to pull the whole show together, and our editors make me look smarter and cooler than I am. <laughs> and and, uh, and it's, it's, it's the best, I think my, my, I get emails every day from people who, have started game nights because of tabletop, or have started, uh, uh, were able to show their non-gaming partners why they're gamers, and that's been really great. A guy emailed me and he said, well, every night when we finished work, uh, uh, I would come home, I'd eat dinner with my family, and then everyone would go to their own thing. And since we started watching tabletop together, we eat dinner and then we all get together and play a board game. Woo! And we're like spending family time together. <laughs> That one of the games we featured on the show uh, sold out from the distributor level. And I said, Oh, how many is that? And he goes, 30,000. <laughs> and there are people telling me that they go to the game shop and the games and they ask for a game, and the game, the game guy says, Oh, because it was on tabletop. <laughs> so it's cool. Like, we're, 
one of the things that I really want to do with my life is like I just I want to inspire people to be awesome and I want to inspire people to do great things and to be kind and to like never lose the joy of doing a thing in the in the in the, 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 the like trying to be the best at it or you know like don't lose the don't lose the the, the journey for the destination and tabletop seems to be fitting with that a little bit. It's great and you do Thanks. inspire people. Thank That's you awesome. Much. Thanks a lot. We have three minutes. Don't make me muster a nerd army, I'll do it. Three minutes, last question. You in the spiky shirt, come on. to be honorable, 
I want you to be kind. I want you to work hard. And I want you to be awesome. And that is what I want all of you to do. Thank you very much.